Well, coming up now, we're going to have Dr. Frank Beckwith uh, talking about another very important uh, topic, the truth about abortion. Dr. Beckwith has a Ph.D. in philosophy. He also has a, an M.A. from Simon Greenleaf in Christian Apologetics. He's a lecturer of philosophy at Simon Greenleaf and at Whittier University. And uh, would you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Beckwith. Like t if they touch each other, do I blow up or something? Or, okay. Captain, the matter and the antimatter. Right. I learned that from Star Trek. You can't mix antimatter with matter. It's, oh, you know, it's not staying on. Just put it there? Okay. It's gravity. Okay. All right. Great to be here. Uh, uh, I'm glad that I was invited. And the, the title of my talk is "The Truth About Abortion." Uh, sort of a kind of a, a vague title, I suppose. Uh, but I think it's an important uh, an important title for what I'm going to be talking about. And that is, I'm going to talk about what I mean, America in America today we, we debate all sorts of things uh, abortion of course uh, is, is one of the most hotly debated issues probably the most hotly debated issue of the last 20 or 30 years from a moral point of view but it's an issue that for all the talk about it it rarely ever gets debated on its merits and, and, and I'll explain what I, what I mean by giving an example of something that most of us are aware of just from recent uh, history, and that is the Republican National Convention. How many of you uh, saw that on television? I I thought, you know, when, when Elizabeth Dole was talking, I, I was looking for an 800 number to buy whatever she was selling. I thought it was an infomercial. Uh, I evidently made, was mistaken. Actually, she was quite wonderful, but it reminded me a lot of one of those infomercials where, you know, Cher is sitting there with her fake friends, and they're talking about hair color or something, <laughs> something like that. I mean, it had that sort of... Uh, uh, take to it, but uh, before the convention, um, there was a big talk about what well, was going to be in the platform for the Republican convention concerning abortion. And uh, four years ago, 1992, I was a delegate from Nevada. I taught for seven years at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas and was very active politically. And and uh, I remember at the time I was given a copy of the Republican platform, and. Uh, Towards the uh, end of July, I thought, well, I'm going to pull this platform out and actually read what it says. You know, one of the things that uh, that most people don't do uh, is they 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 don't read exactly what's under under dispute, whether it's the Republican platform or or the Constitution or 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 or, or, or some legal decision. People typically just rely on the media, uh, their portrayal of what it actually says. So I pulled it out, and the thing that fascinated me was that. There is no abortion plank in the Republican platform. Now, I know that sounds kind of a, like a weird thing to say because there was a lot of talk of it. Uh, and what, what, I, what I mean is, if you, read, if you read the papers, they say that in the Republican platform there is a call for a constitutional amendment to prohibit abortion. You've heard that probably zillions of times since uh, the end of the 92 convention. It's not there. You know what it calls for? It calls for a human life amendment that would protect all human beings regardless of venue or level of development. Now, that of course, I think, implies some prohibition of abortion, doesn't it? But the, but the platform does not actually say abortion is prohibited. Now, why is that important? Why is that? So some people say, well, that's kind of a minor distinction. Well, it's fundamentally important because what's doing the moral work in the abortion debate is not the fact that people are having surgery. What's doing the moral work is the nature of the entity that, that is killed in the abortion. That's why the people who wrote the Republican platform back in 76, and they've pretty much kept the same language since then, understood this. And that's why they wrote it the way they did. In fact, if you look at what section in which this plank uh, w was published, it was published in a section that dealt with general human rights. 
In fact, the beginning talks about Lincoln's stand against slavery, and it goes on to talk about women's suffrage and other, other issues involving individual human rights, and then it includes the unborn. And only later on does it talk about prohibiting federal funding of abortion is abortion mentioned. But it is never mentioned in the section that calls for a constitutional amendment. Now, what I find fascinating is that you never heard anybody, with the exception of Gary Bauer once on this week at David Brinkley, talk about the nature of the platform. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, of, one is most people don't read it. Secondly, can you imagine actually a discussion on a major talk show about the nature of the fetus? It, it, it never happens. I mean, suppose for an, it, for an issue as volatile and as important as everyone acknowledges and as controversial, nobody ever debates whether the fetus is a human person or not. And of course, as, as we know, and I think it'll become clear as I move on in the lecture, that ultimately is, is what's doing the moral work in the debate. In fact, Justice Blackman in Roe v. Wade said that if uh, those, uh, the state of Texas, which was defending its law that prohibited abortion, could show that the fetus is a human person or a human being or human life, depending on which, which way you state it, then the other side's case collapses. I mean, it's clearly acknowledged in Roe v. Wade that's doing the moral work. Now, I think that there's a shift in that thinking, and I'm going to talk about that later on this morning, that, that I think if you look at a lot of recent pro-choice literature, uh, pro-abortion literature, especially in the legal community, there's a shift now away from discussing fetal personhood to a, to a new type of thinking that says it doesn't matter whether the fetus is a person. Now, this is, a, uh, I think, it, it's something, an important development that we ought to recognize. It's not as predominant as you think but you find it in some of the leading thinkers for the other side. Uh, I think immediately of Lawrence Tribe in his book, Abortion, the Clash of Absolutes. It's a whole chapter in there where he defends this view. He says the Supreme Court ought to get away from trying to resolve the question whether the fetus is a human person. Perhaps they should grant it and say still abortion is justified. And he provides an argument for it. And I know that sounds outrageous to most people, but it's out there and it's an important argument and I think it's something that uh, pro-lifers have to wrestle with. Uh, the reason um, um, I bring this up about what's doing the moral work is because the way in which people argue about abortion in public today is absolutely appalling, in my, in my view. Uh, I've been on a number of radio programs uh, since my book, Politically Correct Death, came out three years ago, which deals with the abortion controversy, and everybody who they've pitted me against does not want to talk about the central issue of abortion. What they want to talk about is how virtuous I am, that's, I find that fascinating. The first thing that I often hear is, is, is I, the first thing is either you're a man, right, which is an interesting observation, uh, you know, thank you very much, I have my share of testosterone, thank you, you know, you know I, 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 don't, I, I, I had one, one woman called up on this radio program and she said, you're a man, what do you know about abortion? And, you know, my, my real name is Francis. <laughs> so I said, and that's what it says in the title of the authorship of my book, so I said, how do you know I'm a man? I said, what? Well, how do you know I'm a man? I said, I'm, I'm, at, oops, I'm, I'm, at ho I'm at home talking on the telephone right now, being broadcast on this radio program. You're at home calling up. You've never seen me. You know how do you know I'm a man? So you have a deep voice. Oh, I said, so does Brenda Vaccaro. <laughs> right? She's not a man. Right? And she started, she started to get upset. She was screaming. And typical woman caller. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's just a joke. That's just a joke. What? <laughs> Good point. Good comeback. <laughs> I do the jokes here. <laughs> so I, that's the rule. No, uh, so but, but what, what I, my point was to try to stress to her that really the issue is not who's giving the arguments, but the nature of the arguments. And, and, and finally she conceded that and the host of the show was laughing. And, and what, what typically happens, that's one way uh, that, that, that people try to avoid the issue. The other is to talk about the virtue of pro-lifers. How virtuous pro-lifers are. I had a there, there, a couple of years ago, I, I was reading a um, newspaper, and, 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 and what's her name, Dear Abby, or what's the other one? Her, her, Ann Landers, their sisters. Uh, um, 
and uh, they uh, it was one of those columns and they re they reprint this column I, I think every five or six months or every every couple of years there's this one letter that gets republished that says you know if these people who protest abortions would just adopt the children that they that they that they don't want aborted then they would be better people and we would take them seriously well of course that that first off is is not always true I mean many pro-lifers do adopt the children and many of them work in crisis pregnancy centers and uh, for years I've lectured for CPC and 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 a no a number of my friends who have donated money and time to these organizations so in terms of the accuracy of that that's false but even if it were uh, e e even even if even if she were right that pro-lifers would don't do enough that doesn't mean abortion is not homicide <laughs> it's, it's a totally separate issue it's one thing to question someone's character. It's quite another to say that their arguments are flawed. For, for, for example, uh, in a debate that I, I had back at, at UNLV back in '89, I had a debate partner, um, a um, a fellow who was a, a graduate student at the time at UNLV in ethics and policy studies, and he was pro, very strongly pro-life. And we were challenged. In fact, uh, this, this debate was set up by one of my colleagues between both of us and, a, and an attorney and a social work professor on the issue of abortion and the social during the towards the end of the debate there was a question and answer period and they had people walk up to the microphone and uh, uh, one of the questioners looked at us and said well why don't you adopt the children that you don't want aborted and then all the you know the purple shirt people in the audience yeah, yeah you guys you know and so David who was my partner said he said, I have three children, and he, and he does have three children. He said, I, I'm going to execute them at midnight unless you adopt them. If you don't adopt them, am I justified in executing them? And the woman said, no, because they're children. Well, then why is abortion justified if other people don't want to adopt the children? And she said, well, it's different. Oh, so then the real issue is whether the fetus is a person. Whether pro-lifers want to adopt the children isn't relevant. That doesn't mean it isn't important, but in terms of a, the truth about abortion, in terms of what we're arguing about, the central focus, the real focus is whether the fetus is a person, not whether pro-lifers are virtuous people. And I, that's why I don't like to argue about that. I had, um, uh, I had one, um, one fellow uh, I was debating from the Bay Area in LA, in, LA, in San Francisco, um, and he, he was a, he was a Methodist minister who was um, head. He worked for the National Abortion Rights Action League. He's like the meanest Methodist minister, <laughs> right? Who was a mountain man? No, I just threw that in there because it's dark for them. Um, and he uh, he starts out by saying, "Well, your problem with you pro-lifers is that you." Um, you uh, you believe in capital punishment and you know you say you're pro-life that's inconsistent that was his opening statement and, and I responded by saying well first off you don't know my views on capital punishment I said there are some pro-lifers who are for it some who are against it for, for different reasons some are against capital punishment because they come out of the the peace churches some some theologies are, are against capital punishment I don't I don't necessarily think their theology is correct but they're pro-lifers when it comes to abortion others are uh, oppose uh, are opposed capital punishment not because they oppose it in principle because they think our legal system is flawed in some way and that the wrong people are getting killed so there's all sorts of reasons why people oppose or favor capital punishment and they're interesting and I'd be delighted to debate that issue but we're here to debate abortion I don't know if you know this but we were invited to debate abortion not to debate whether I'm consistent in my views I, you know what? I, I'll tell you what. I am inconsistent. I'm wrong about capital punishment, but I'm right about abortion. So let's argue about that. <laughs> See, the, the problem is everybody wants to talk about everything else except abortion. I mean, it is incredible. Um, e even if, I mean, you, I received a piece of literature from a candidate who was running for office who said, my opponent is anti-choice. Now, I don't... But the word abortion never appeared. Anti-choice. I called the guy up, and I said, 
I said, now what do you mean by anti-choice? Well, this person is against a woman's choice. I said, well, choice for what? And he, it took him like five minutes to finally say the word abortion. I mean, it just, it was incredible. And then I went on to ask him, I, and I knew his uh, politics in other areas, I said, so you're in favor of, I said, now let me get the other thing, you're in favor of a woman's choice, right? Yeah. So if a woman has a tree growing in her backyard with a spot of owl on it, she can cut down the tree. Because you're pro-choice, right? Because you believe that she's got a right to make choices about her life, including cutting down trees in her backyard. No, I said, so you're not pro-choice. So she, let's say she owns a business and she wants to pay people less than minimum wage. And you're for that choice. No. She says, let me get this straight. You are in favor, you're against virtually every choice in this person's life except for abortion. So if this person owns a business, and, and, and let's say this person wants to rent a room in her home, uh, but she, a homosexual couple comes by, wants to rent it, you think that she has to rent it. Uh, yes, that would violate their rights. I said, so let me understand this. She has no rights to do anything in her private life except have an abortion. See, what, what's going on here is the use of rhetoric that is absolutely, incredibly disingenuous. No, they're not pro. You know, the only people who are really pro-choice are the libertarians. I have greater respect for them because they're consistent. I mean, they, they don't believe that the state should have any jurisdiction in people's lives whatsoever. And, and, and I don't agree with their views on many things, but at least they're... They're intellectually consistent, and, and, and you know we'd ha you have to argue with them on a different level. But the, the point is that, that the use of language today uh, tries to avoid the nature of the choice itself. Another uh, misuse of language has to do with uh, the use of the word tolerance when it comes to the abortion debate. This is one of the most frustrating aspects uh, of, of debating abortion. Uh, immediately if you say, well, I'm, I'm opposed to abortion rights, I believe the fetus is a person, and therefore the state has an obligation to protect all persons regardless of where they may live, uh, so I think that, that abortion ought to be prohibited by law. And that's, you know, and somebody responds, well, you're intolerant of other people's views, you're trying to force your religious beliefs on others. And uh, you'll have people typically go on and say, you know, I'm pro-choice. I'm not... I mean, I wouldn't have an abortion myself, right? But, or I, you know, I, I, but I don't think I should force my views on others. This is an attempt to sort of have a neutral position. It's like I, I'm not pro-abortion. I, I don't believe that it's a good thing. But on the other hand, I don't want to force people. See, and whereas you want to force people, so you're intolerant. Where I'm tol whereas I'm tolerant. Okay. That's how the, t the argument goes. It's a very popular argument. It's an argument that you often hear by politicians. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago uh, in Las Vegas, and I wish I had brought a copy of it. I'd for I forgot to. Uh, I wrote a letter to the editor about this. It was right after this guy John Salvey had, had killed people in an abortion clinic in Boston. And, and I think what he did was absolutely wrong, so I'm not advocating what he did. But as a, to sort of show the, the, the absolute stupidity of the argument I just presented. I wrote a letter to the editor that was a, it was uh, sarcastic. It was a parody. Now, well, I underestimated the intelligence of people in Southern Nevada, which is not a difficult thing to do. And uh, I'm from there, so I can say that. It's like your own mother. You can make fun of her, but if other people do, you got to beat them up. <laughs> uh, so uh, what happened? Uh, I wrote this piece to letter. Uh, letter to the editor began by I began by saying, "I'm personally opposed to shooting abortion doctors." However, if uh, I said, be, uh, however, if somebody believes that it is within their cultural tradition to shoot abortion doctors, who am I to make that sort of judgment that it's wrong? I don't believe that my sanctity of life ethic should be forced on others who believe that perhaps shooting abortion doctors is consistent with their own deeply held religious beliefs. And that's I signed it. So I said, so, so I remain moderately pro-choice. I had letters to my... I had a my fa faculty meeting. Uh, my chairman said he got so many phone calls and letters saying that they cannot believe that a person teaches at UNLV who believes it's okay to shoot abortion doctors. I mean, they, I had a, a friend of mine who worked for Planned Parenthood for public relations there. She no longer works there now. But she called me up and she goes, I don't get your letter. 
I mean, I was just amazed at this because I thought, but th that's how strongly instantiated the rhetoric is that people can't even step away from it and reflect on it. I mean, it's so much a part of the, the worldview that they don't even think of it's something to even think about. And uh, eventually I had to explain it to some people. I had a doctor right and a physician teaches at University of Atlanta Medical School who's actually pro-life who wrote to me and was said, I cannot believe that you defended this view. That's the problem with our society, this political correctness stuff, and I can't believe you're espousing it. I had to write the guy back and explain to him, and he called me. He said, I'm really embarrassed. You know, I, I didn't get what you were trying to say. Because it's so much a part of our culture, people can't even see when you're making fun of it. I mean, that's kind of scary. And getting, getting back to how do you respond to this type of argument, well... Uh, one way that I've responded to it is to ask the question of the other person uh, because uh, along these lines do you believe the fetus is a human person that ought to be protected and if they say no then you say your position is not neutral you see if I were let me give you an analogy supposing I was back in the 19th century and I said I personally would never own a slave but if you want to own a slave, that's fine with you because who am I to make judgments about your own personal morality? And I would, and I'd say, see, I'm not pro-slavery or anti-slavery. I'm just simply pro-choice on the issue. You would immediately recognize that that's not a neutral position because it's implying what that slaves are not human persons; that they're property and they can be owned. Now, once once that's sort of fleshed out and explained, you realize it's not neutral. It's a position. It's saying slaves. These certain group of individuals are not human persons. That's a position. So when somebody says, I believe that the government ought to allow abortions, ought to allow fetuses to be killed, you are implying what? Fetuses are not the sort of beings that ought to be protected by the state. That's a position. It's not neutral. It's not neutral. And yet it's framed as if it's neutral and not... Not often do people are people forced to defend their position when they when they take it. Uh, the media uh, typically do not ask tough questions to pro-choice uh, candidates for office or politicians. I don't think it's because the media is intentionally biased. It just never crosses their mind. In the few cases where they have them, uh, where uh, it, it crosses their their mind to even inquire to even ask the question. It's like, to them, it's like they're colorblind. It, it, to ask them about what's blue or red doesn't even, I mean, is, is, they don't even see it. Um, the number of times that I've lectured on this, in, in fact, in, in, where I've had audiences where there have been some people in the media, I've had people come up to me literally saying, I have, this is incredible stuff. I've never thought about it this way. And to me, that's a shock, but then I'm going to have to tell myself that once that people have never really thought about uh, this stuff in much detail, I mean, this is, this is pretty typical. Plus, when you write on it and talk about it all the time, you sort of make the mistake of projecting your own knowledge on other people, and that's a, that's a dangerous uh, thing to, to do. But the point is that when people talk about this, they talk about everything except for abortion. I'm pro-choice, I'm neutral, and I'm not trying to force my views, but never is the question of the moral nature of the act even up for grabs. And part of the, 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 the I think, the, the, the brilliance of the pro-choice um, public relations machine is, is, is this very thing, to not talk about it. To not talk about it. They'll talk about everything except for, except for the nature of, of abortion. All right, let's move on um, and talk about... Uh, uh, the thing that I alluded to earlier about the, uh, the, the shift in focus in the abortion debate that's, a, that's going on in, 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 in the legal literature as well as um, uh, in some popular discourse. A couple of years ago, there was a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court which uh, kept in place Roe v. Wade. It's called Casey v. Planned Parenthood. Some of you may be familiar with that decision. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Casey decision? It's a, it was a decision that that uh, actually was fascinating because there's a uh, basically the decision says that nearly every aspect of Roe v. Wade uh, doesn't hold, but the the, the the position still stands. That was in fact that that gave uh, Justice uh, Rehnquist, in his dissenting opinion, uh, an opportunity to say the following. He said it's like an old movie set. 
everything is there, but there's nothing behind it. It's a great, great uh, analogy uh, that he used. Uh, but in the um, uh, in the uh, in the Casey decision, I'm trying to find the quote here. Um, let's see. All right. In the Casey decision, uh, there's a there's a um, a statement made by um, made by the Supreme Court. Um, that uh, that I find to be uh, fascinating. It, it it says, and I you know I don't actually have the exact quote here, but I'll paraphrase it for you. Uh, instead of um, in the past, in the Roe v. Wade, the court said that really the the, the, the issue hinges on fetal personhood, and then, then they also tried to justify it by saying by appealing to the right to privacy, by saying that since there's a right to privacy, and uh, since abortion laws in the 19th century were not intended to, say, for, to protect the fetus, but to protect the mother, which is not true, uh, it turns out. Um, uh, therefore, abortion is uh, abortion laws that uh, abor- laws that prohibit abortion, except for in very rare cases, um, uh, you know, to protect the, the the woman's life, are, are unconstitutional. Now. Uh, What's fascinating about the, the Casey decision, there's a quote in there that's, that, that where the court says that, that the, the, the Constitution, uh, based on the 14th Amendment, uh, which is written right after the Civil War, uh, to, protect, to, to, pr- to protect people's due process, it wasn't intended to, to, um, um, to establish abortion rights. I don't know if <laughs> you knew that. I mean, they didn't, the guys after the Civil War didn't have the last thing on their mind if it was even on their mind. Um, uh, they, the court argued that the 14th Amendment was intended to protect personal autonomy rather than, rather than the right to privacy. It would happen. See, in 1986, there was a decision called Bowers vs. Hardwick. I mean, it's the decision which the Supreme Court upheld anti-sodomy laws by a five to four decision. And that was the, the really the la- that was pretty much the, the, the liberals had gotten out of the privacy right to privacy, everything they can get. Because when the 5-4 to four decision came down, the, the liberals in the court and the liberal establishment knew they were not going to get anything else out of the right to privacy. They got abortion, they got nearly everything, but they couldn't get personal, consensual, sexual relations as something that could be established by the right to privacy. So the right to privacy was used up. So they had to establish abortion rights on another ground. And what they did was the right to personal autonomy. That's why I think that gay marriage is inevitable. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be cynical about this, but the way the current makeup of the court and the reasoning in Casey and the recent Romer decision, it, it, it still may lose if it goes to the Supreme Court, but I'm not as hopeful as I would have been maybe five or six years ago. Because if you, if, in Webster, which was another decision that ch- chipped away at Roe, it looked as though the, 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 the Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned. And then all of a sudden, 92, they come up with this view of, of personal autonomy. Let me see if I... You know what? I, uh, let's, I just want to see if uh, I do... Oh, here it is. Oh, this is great. Okay, I did quote it. This is from an article I wrote. I wanted... The best notes you can take are your own, right? Uh... <laughs> This is from Casey v. Planned Parenthood. Uh, this is what it says, quote, Our law affords constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage. So this is why this is really important to the gay marriage thing. Our law affords constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and education. These matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to choices central to personal dignity and autonomy are central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters cannot define the attributes of personhood where they formed under co- compulsion by the state. Unquote. That is not Shirley McLean that I read. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. It almost sounds like some New Age mantra. It's almost it's eerie. Uh, it's so unlawlike in its writing. It's very philosophical. It's basically saying that the, the the Constitution, when it comes to questions that involve marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, education, have nothing to say except for permitting people to have their own personal autonomy. Now, what's personal autonomy? The word autonomy refers to self-rule, self-law. And that there are no social or public goods that can stop people from actions that involve 
their personal decisions. Now, the reason why I bring this quote up is that there's, a, to me, this signals a shift in the thinking of the court from feudal personhood as being the ruling norm to personal autonomy. Now, why is this important? Well, think about in terms of your own what the law can do to you in terms of your obligation to others. Uh, if, let's say, your neighbor, you have two kidneys, right? Everybody has, well, unless one was removed, but in general, people have only two kidneys, right? Let's say your neighbor, Fred, needs a kidney, right? He's dying, and you happen to be the one that fits. Your kidney fits. Uh, you know that if you don't donate it, Fred's dead, right? That rhymes, too. Uh, Fred, Fred winds up dying. Now, if you, if you choose not to donate your kidney, you're not a bad person, are you? I mean, you'd be a great person if you donated a kidney. I mean, it involves great risk on your part, and the law does not require, and I think in some cases, morality does not require great risk on the part of people. I mean, years ago, there was a guy, there was a guy who dove into the Potomac to push those people up in the plane crash in Washington, D.C., now, if he had not done it, we wouldn't consider him bad if he didn't do it, but because he did it and he risked his life, he's a great person. Now, what legal scholars are saying is that the law should not require women to carry babies to term, even if they're human persons, because it involves great risk and a violation of their personal autonomy, just like the law cannot require you to donate your kidney to your neighbor Fred. Your, fr your neighbor Fred is fully a human person. Maybe not my neighbor Fred. <laughs> my wife knows what I'm talking about. I have, a, I have a neighbor. I used to have a neighbor named Fred in Vegas. Fred, um, kind of a macho kind of guy, you'd say. Male chauvinist pig, as she puts it. I, I didn't say it. Um, he is follically challenged. He's bald, okay? Follically challenged. He, uh, one day, uh, my wife was, uh, was publicly humiliating me in front of the neighbors. Uh, she was telling me what to do. For men, just being told what to do is just bad enough, right? Uh, do this, mow the lawn. Fred walks by and he goes, Hey, I know who wears the pants in your family. So I look at him, I say, I know where the, who wears the hair in your family. <laughs> I'm quite proud of myself. It was one of those, you know. But my neighbor Fred, he's a kidney. I don't donate it to him. He dies. Um, I'm, I, I'm not responsible for killing him. I, was, I, not, I didn't commit an act of homicide because I didn't donate my kidney. Now, let me read you a story provided by Judith Jarvis Thompson, who is a philosopher at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She, she gave an argument in 1971, that's 25 years ago, a year before, two years before Roe v. Wade, which did not factor into the Supreme Court's decision, but has now been cited by a number of legal scholars as the way around the abortion debate, by saying that the fetus is like my neighbor Fred. Fred's a human person, so is the fetus. But I shouldn't be required to save the fetus, and I shouldn't be required to save Fred. You see the logic of it? Personal autonomy. Personal autonomy is the focus rather than the fetus's personhood. I have, the state has no right to obligate me to take care of, or to force another person, the fetus, to use my body against my will. That's the logic, and it's, it's, and it's being seen more and more, and, I, and my view is that uh, if more, uh, if um, the current occupant of the White House remains the current occupant of the White House after November, and he will appoint one or two Supreme Court justices, and I think that they will take on abortion one more time, and my view is that they will do it this way. It will shock people as much as Roe v. Wade shocked people, but it's a type of argument that I don't think pro-lifers are prepared to respond to. Because we're used to arguing the way I did 15 minutes ago, which is a perfectly good way to argue in public because most people, that's part of their intuitions. They realize the fetus is a person, abortion's wrong, even though they may not think about it. But once the paradigm is shifted and things change and personal autonomy becomes the focus, it's a whole different ball game. It doesn't matter whether you prove the fetus is a person, right? Let's say it doesn't matter. Now it's, di it's different. This is what happened with infanticide in, in, the, in the early 80s. 
in the late 70s. Uh, people in medical ethics used to argue who are pro-life. They used to argue, well, you know, if the, hey, look, there's no difference between the, the newborn and, 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 the, um, and, the, and the fetus. So therefore, since we can't kill the fetus, we shouldn't be allowed to kill the newborn. Or if, since we can't kill the newborn, we shouldn't be allowed to kill the fetus, right? You know what they said? They said, you're right, there is no difference. That's why you can kill the newborn. You see, some, sometimes people bite the bullet and go the other way. So that's why we have to, so we have to look at what's going on on the horizon. This is the, 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 the illustration provided by Judith Jarvis Thompson, who I mentioned a moment ago. She says, you wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. He has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist circulatory system was plugged into yours. Excuse me. So that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known, but still they did it. And the violinist now is plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months. But then he will have re recovered from the, his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? Thompson writes. No doubt it would be very nice of you if you did a great kindness, but do you have to accede to it? What if, you were not, what if it were not nine months but nine years? Or still longer? What if the director of the hospital says to you, quote, Tough luck, I agree, but, you're now, but you've now got to stay in bed with the violinist plugged into you for the rest of your life. Because remember this, all persons have a right to life and violinists are persons. Granted, you have a right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in and to your body. So you cannot ever be unplugged from him. I imagine that you would find this as outrageous. That's Thompson. Now, it's 1971. Now, a couple of reasons why I think the courts have not used this, because at the time, there was no basis for this personal autonomy view that we don't get until Casey, in my, in my view. So the Supreme Court had to wrestle with the current law and the current decisions, and at that time, it was the right to privacy, and they found it on the right to privacy. But in Casey, we have the right to personal autonomy. You, and what does personal autonomy entail? Let me repeat what the court said in Casey. Constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and education, and in addition to that, one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood where they formed under compulsion by the state. So I think you have now, finally, in the court, something that you can hinge this Thompson reasoning to. It's no accident that in 1990, um, uh, Lawrence Tribe, who's got a tremendous influence on the liberal wing of the Supreme Court, uh, also a number of his, uh, his former students uh, worked as clerks for Anthony Kennedy and, um, and um, I think Souter as well, who were, wrote the, this portion of the, of the Casey decision that I read. And of course they were appointed by who? Bush and Reagan. Kennedy, Souter, and O'Connor, right? And this is what we got from, from those guys. Uh, this is what... Um, um, Tribe writes in his book, Abortion, the Clash of Absolutes. He says, perhaps the Supreme Court's opin opinion in Roe, by gratuitously insisting that the fetus cannot be deemed a person, needlessly insulted and alienated those for whom the view that the fetus is a person represents a fundamental article of faith or a bedrock personal commitment. The court could instead have said, quote, even if the fetus is a person, our Constitution forbids compelling a woman to carry it for nine months and become a mother. 1993, the book by Stephen Carter, some of you may have heard of Stephen Carter, wrote the book The Culture of Disbelief, 1993, actually a quite a good book in terms of criticizing the liberal establishment's attack on religious belief. And it, it got wide, uh, wide reading and a lot of very, very uh, um, I, uh, high reviews. I mean, a lot of people recommended the book. It was a wonder, wonderful book. But there's a section that deals with the abortion controversy that I found fascinating because Carter makes the same. Carter's a professor at Yale Law School makes the same recommendation as Tribe. 
and this is what Carter says, quote, as many theorists have recognized, the right to choose abortion, if it indeed survives, must be based on an approach that allows abortion even if the fetus is human. Instead of an approach that denies a humanity under cover of the pretense that the definition is none of the state's business. The conclusion of fetal humanity by no means ends the argument. It simply forces the striking of a balance. My point is that the only fair way around a successful legislative effort to define the fetus as human, the only option that does not deride religiously based moral judgments as inferior to secular ones, is to argue for a right to abortion despite it. And an argument of that kind does not require an attack on the religious motivation of any abortion opponents. So now what you have here in, 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 in Professor Carter's argument, he's saying, in order for us to appease the religious right, we'll give them the fetus, but we'll still have abortion rights. I, and what's interesting is, guess who he cites? Judas Jarvis Thompson's 1971 argument. Uh, so does Tribe in his book. Now, I think what, what, what Carter misunderstands and I think what Tribe misunderstands is that the pro-life position is not merely that the fetus is a human person and that uh, killing the fetus because of that is homicide. That's obviously a great deal. Uh, it's a great part of it. But the pro-life position entails a certain view of community and relationships as well. That parents have certain obligations to ch their children. They don't have the strangers. That as members of the human community, we have responsibilities to those less vulnerable than ourselves such as small children, the handicapped fetuses, and others. It isn't simply we're just a bunch of rights-carrying entities that run in conflict with each other, and some of them happen to be really small, and but we have no obligations to them. I think the problem with, with both Carter and Tribe and those who espouse this position is, is, is a, clear, I think a clear ignorance of, uh, uh, of what it means to be a member of the human community and what it means to be a parent. What they're undermining is not just that they're granting fetal person, but they're doing something far worse. They're saying that the family as institution is merely a social construction. That is, it's not real, it's not part of the furniture of the universe. It's something we make up. And that there's no inherent or special relationship that parents have to children. Because what, 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 what are they doing? They're saying the fetus, the relationship that the fetus has to the, to the mother is no different than two strangers who happen to run into each other by way of a mechanical device. That, I think, is maybe worse than abortion. <laughs> because in the long run, that undermines all our values. All our values. Ultimately, this is what's behind the, the, the gay, the same-sex marriage debate. It's not a debate between people who want to be more tolerant and allow more people to marry and those who are intolerant. It's a debate between those who believe that marriage is, in fact, an institution that is grounded in our nature and the way that God made the universe versus those who believe that marriage is simply a social construction that we make up like red lights and green lights at intersections. I was on a show once where I talked about same-sex marriage and I asked the person who I was going against, uh, why can't I marry myself? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, they, they, want to li they want to say only two. Uh, Gary Bauer said, why not more? I say, why not less? <laughs> you know, why can't I if I if I'm not ma if I'm not married to another person or myself? Why can't I check married on the? I mean, after all, why should I accept his narrow view of what marriage is? <laughs> See, the problem with same sex same sex marriage is it it really destroys marriage because if if marriage is, is only if, if marriage is not an objective institution that that has some grounding in nature as the way God made us uh, or as the way nature has evolved if you're if you're a secularist. Uh, it, then you, you simply have I mean there's no stopping I mean th then you have if it's simply personal autonomy and uh, and uh, consenting adults then why can't I marry my two brothers oh okay, okay. you want me to okay I thought you were going to ask the question why can't I marry my two brothers so uh, so this is where the abortion debate is shifting oh is it okay now? And why should why shouldn't I mean why should marriage be limited to just two? Why not three or four or a larger ensemble, right? And why not other creatures? 
perhaps they want to participate in our love. Right? Right? You know? I mean, you know, every time this... I heard uh, Hadley, Hadley Arcus um, uh, in... Um, uh, who's a professor at Amherst College, used this on this th- show called Think Tank. I don't know if you ever see this show, Think Tank, with Ben, ben Wattenberg. And, 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 and the gay rights... The gay rights people freak out at this argument. They don't have an answer to it. They basically say, well, that's not the situation now, which means they have no principled objection. Oh, I know. I just don't want it on tape because I don't want my house burned or something <laughs> by these tolerant people. Is it okay now? Okay, good. Um, yeah, did you hear about the skeptical agnostics? They burn question marks on your lawn? Or the skeptical Ku Klux Klan members, right? They burn question marks on your lawn. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, getting back to the issue of, uh, of autonomy. So you see there's a shift in the reasoning now in, in the way in which the Supreme Court is, is talking about the issue and the way in which uh, uh, people are now going to be, I think, arguing for it in the future. You're going to hear more of this stress on autonomy, and I think we have to have an answer to it. Now, what's the answer to it? Well, uh, one I've already alluded to, and that is it undermines the notion of family. Now, as a national institution, now there are some people who say, oh, fine, let's get rid of the family. Uh, but in terms of popular support, uh, it's, it, it's not go- it's, even though our culture is declining, it hasn't declined that much yet. Uh, so, I mean, it's still, that type of argument still resonates with a lot of people. Secondly, it, uh, it assumes, I think, falsely that all moral obligations are voluntary. That is, that the only obligations you have are ones you want. And uh, I, I, I provide a story I, I, in my book uh, to, to explain why, why that is counterintuitive as a position. Uh, imagine that you had a, there was a, cu- a couple that, uh, that, had, that had sex, and, um, and they, uh, one of them, uh, the woman gets pregnant. One of them, with a woman. <laughs> it's like I was at a, um, I was at some gathering. I was got invited by this uh, evangelical group uh, that's kind of that, that's lib- uh, kind of a liberal evangelicals. They're pro-life, but they're on the left on other issues. And, and there was a um, a professor there from Minnesota, and, and she she said, "Oh, what does your spouse do?" I don't have a spouse. I have a wife. I don't like spouse. It's like, you know, it's like, how are your, you know, it's like, I have a brother and I have a sister, I don't have siblings. I don't know, I don't like these clinical terms for, for relatives, you know. Yeah, come in and see our neonate, you know. It's a baby, you know. I, I cross out, whenever I get a point to spouse, I cross out and put wife. Because I, you know, and I know it sounds paranoid, but I think it's part of the, the, the gendering of our culture where, I mean, I think wife and husband are, have definitive meanings, and I think that they're, they're, they have definitive roles. And, 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 and I think that well, when you say spouse, you can sort of plug anything in there, right? You can put Bob and Fred, right? You know, because they're just all spouses after all. Or is it spice? Is that the plural for spouse? I don't know, like mouse and mice. Um, but, uh, uh, so I mean, I don't like that. It's part of the degendering of our culture. It drives me crazy, so I cross out. I put wife. I don't put spouse. So, okay. Um, what was I talking about? That's right. Um, uh, getting back to the, the story about the couple who uh, who have uh, they, they have sex and one of uh, the, the the woman gets pregnant and uh, uh, according to uh, the way most people think and the way actually our courts think is that 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 man uh, the father of that child is obligated to take care of that child even though she can get an abortion. In fact, let's say when they had sex that that they, he used a condom. So obviously his intention was not to voluntarily become a father. And yet he's obligated to take care of that child even though he did not volunteer to be a father. Now what I find interesting is, as far as I know, no one has used that argument in in a court to get deadbeat dads off the hook. Although in terms of the logic of Roe v. Wade and the logic of Casey, it's, it's a perfectly plausible argument. I mean, you say, hey, hey, you know, why should he be held hostage by this woman who could, who could get an abortion? Either she gets an abortion or if she, brings, she can bring the child up him, herself, but why should he be obligated? He didn't intend to be a father. Now, you see what happens in terms of our culture. We undermine the natural obligations that parents have to children by saying that all obligations are voluntary. I mean, that is poison for the fa- familial obligations. Absolute poison once you say that all obligations are equal. And part of our, the, the liberal mindset is that all obligations are equal. After all, it takes a village, right? It takes the village people. 
right? Right. Uh, you have a, I mean, this notion that, and this is a question I raised in a debate to, to a woman I was debating. I said, let me understand this. According to your worldview, a pregnant woman who's a taxpayer has a greater obligation to the stranger's children than she does to the child in her womb. Think about that. I mean, you have people who will argue for a more, a, a larger and more um, obtuse welfare state on the basis that we are obligated to take care of our, our neighbors. And, and, I, and I think in terms of a moral precept, that's not a bad moral precept. But the problem is, on the other hand, they say that we have a, less of an obligation to take care of our own children. I mean, that's part of the, 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 the liberal mindset, that we're sort of all equal, that strangers have the same relationship to each other, that family members do. And I think that ultimately is poison for the family. And one of the, I, I think, uh, perhaps some of our, our more vocal and more popular uh, uh, Christian defenders of the family ought to be arguing that way. I think that's a, it's a very persuasive way to argue that, the, that what makes liberalism uh, harmful to the family is that it treats all relationships equally. And I think that would resonate with a lot of people, even many liberals who may feel uncomfortable with the policies. Typically, it's done implicitly by saying, well, see, welfare dependency undermines the father's uh, role in the family. But, and I think that's true uh, in the long run. But I think, uh, I think what it also does, it, it says that the rest of society is obligated in a way to strangers. They're not obligated to their own children, which I, I think is, is probably more harmful and more poisonous to our popular culture. A second objection to uh, Thompson's argument is, all, is, um, is along the same lines. Um, um, and that is that it ignores family law. If you look at our, our legal structure, uh, parents do have uh, uh, obligations to children, that uh, their own children, they don't have to strangers. I think that's one of the problems that, that, that if the Supreme Court were to concede fetal personhood that they would have to get over and, and have to address. Um, let me quote uh, here a, a statement from two legal scholars who write, All 50 states, the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have child abuse and neglect statutes which, re which provide for the protection of a child who does not receive needed medical care. Parents are obligated to provide extraordinary care to children if it's needed for their, for their livelihood. There have been the Christian science cases. Uh, there have been cases where a child made an operation uh, that, that the parents say we don't want to do it. Uh, now, there have been recent cases that I think, it, it, I think it's baby, um, the baby Jane Doe or baby Joe, Doe, I forget, or baby Roe, one of those um, baby cases in the 80s. There was one in Indiana where a child was born with a spina bifida possibility of, of mental retardation. Uh, the spina bifida was easily correctable, and there was an easily correctable block in the esophagus. And so the, the, the physicians simply, um, the, the parents said, well, we don't want the esophagus unblocked. And so the physicians didn't do anything and the child started to death. Now, the, the, the problem here is that, is that, they, uh, that the reason why they did it is because the child was going to probably be retarded. I mean, if the child wasn't going to be, you bet your bottom dollar they would have had that surgery. So basically that child was killed because of its handicap. Because of its handicap. And fortunately, the Congress, a couple months later, voted 99 to 0 uh, to, um, uh, to post in hospitals an uh, 800 number and about if, if they know that such things are happening, if nurses or other physicians know that this is happening. Uh, but for the most part, the law does require that, um, that parents ha um, secure emergency medical treatment. Uh, and of course, uh, the difference, of course, with pregnancy is that pregnancy isn't treatment, it's natural. Isn't the, fet the fetus is not suffering from something. It's exactly where it belongs. In fact, that's why I think the analogy with, with my friend Fred or with even emergency medical care or the violinist breaks down is that, is that in those cases, it's simply an unnatural or an extraordinary form of treatment. Pregnancy or child, uh, the child development in the womb is not treatment. It's where it's supposed to be. It's its environment. And so I think the, the, the analogy breaks down at that point. The problem is that we have a, such a strong notion of egalitarianism, that is a notion of such a strong notion of equality in our public culture and law, that the assumption behind much of this rhetoric is that pregnancy is somehow unnatural and that 
and, and what's and what all what's also interesting, and, and I think that you have an implied sexism here on the part of our uh, our legal culture is that is that the absence of pregnancy, which of course is mostly associated with men's lives, becomes the norm. So what you have is basically women are considered unequal unless they can have surgery, namely abortion. I mean, you have almost an implied chauvinism here. And this is the irony here, is that in the, the rhetoric of the pro-choicers implies that ordinary natural processes that occur with being female should be corrected by surgery, which of course means that women are in naturally inferior to men. I mean, this is, the, I think, one of the sort of paradoxes of contemporary feminism, at least some forms of it, is this, is this that without surgery, women are not equal to men. In fact, I have a... Uh, let's see if I can find the quote here from... Um, uh, okay, I'm not going to try to look for it. From um, uh, Kate Nickelman of the National Abortion Rights Action League. She says uh, the same sort of thing. She says, you know, uh, without uh, abortion, women cannot be equal to men in society. That's a paraphrase. Well, that applies what? That they're naturally inferior. I mean, there's, a, there's a, ironically a type of the very paternalism that feminists in every other sphere reject, they accept when it comes to abortion. So we are nearly out of time for my talk. Are there any questions before I before I go? Uh, I'll open up the floor for about five minutes for questions. Yes. In regards to uh, capital punishment mm -hmm. and the imminence of the unborn, the question was brought up. That's a good question. Uh, it's a question I do address in, in my book. And, and what I did when I was examining, this is a very, very important question. I, it's a rhetor in many ways, it's a rhetorical question presented by pro-choices because it really is, it, it shifts the focus away from the fetus as a human being to what the penalties are going to be if abortion is illegal. It's a kind of a scare tactic. I mean, like, it, I mean, if abortion is legal, you're going to throw women in jail. That's the, 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 the and it's, but it's a legitimate question nevertheless. But it, you should keep in mind that it has nothing to do with whether abortion is homicide. I mean, it still could be homicide, and it may very well be that we just can't, that may very well be the penalty, but we just can't stomach it. I mean, just because we can't stomach something doesn't make it wrong. wrong. So, but I think there's an answer to it, and, and, and the answer is this. I, I did, while well, working on politically correct death, I did research on what were the penalties before Roe v. Wade. I mean, this is something that, you know, it, it amazed me, because it, 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 abortion was illegal, right? So we can figure it out. I, well, what the courts did and what legislat legislatures did, I think it's very wise what they did, they, they, they assume that any woman seeking an abortion, was, in most cases, not all, is within a desperate situation. So they, they gave was immunity to the woman so that she could uh, uh, report the physician who performed the abortion so that there could be a prosecution. See, the problem with this abortion situation is that everyone involved is a party to the crime. You've got the woman who's having the abortion, the nurse who may be there, and the physician. Now, you have to give somebody immunity in order to prosecute the crime. I mean, if you look at the history of abortion law, there are very few, there are very few convictions because nobody's going to talk. Right? So you, what you have to do is, is allow somebody immunity. And so the thinking was, now it may appear meant to many people today somewhat paternalistic, but I think there's a certain amount of truth to it that, that the woman seeking an abortion was probably coerced by a husband or a boyfriend or uh, there's some desperate situation in her life, so she's not as guilty as the abortionist. So my thinking would be that in order to get more, in order to prevent more abortions, that you would uh, prevent, yeah, to prevent more abortions, you would probably have to have, have the same type of law, because you have to let, you'd have to, in order to convict people, you need witnesses. And the person who's probably the most qualified to be the witness, and at the same time, uh, probably is not as guilty as the other parties is the woman and so she ought, she ought to be given immunity. That's my way around it. Now, some people would say, well, that's, you're sort of, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're just trying to say that because you want people to, you know, to think that it's not going to be as harsh. But I'm just looking at the law before Roe v. Wade and, and that's, that was the thinking back then and I think that's the thinking uh, is going is to be today.